Good afternoon. My name is JJ Spoon, and I'm Professor of Political Science and Director of the European Studies Center at the University of Pittsburgh. Welcome to our final conversation on Europe of the semester, which is the fourth and final in our series, Creating Europe Through, which is part of our Year of Creating Europe series. Each of these conversations has explored the creation of what Europe is, Europeanness, and European identity. Today's topic is Creating Europe Through Creative Europe. You will have the opportunity to ask questions um, using the chat or the Q&A function. Uh, feel free to post a question at any time during the discussion, and I will try to get to as many of these as I can uh, during today's uh, discussion. Today's conversation is sponsored by the European Studies Center, which is part of the University Center of International Studies at Pitt. It's co-funded by the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. Our co-sponsors are the Center for European Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at Florida International University, and the European Union Center at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign, and the Jean Monnet Center of Excellence at the University of Florida. To learn more about our past conversations on Europe, including recordings and additional materials and programming, we are doing with other EU-funded institutions in the US through the Jean Monnet and the USA Initiative, please visit our website. And one of my colleagues will put that in the chat. Uh, finally, I want to thank Iris Matievich and Kenny Riley for their help with today's event. Culture has long been central to the European project. In fact, Jean Monnet, one of the founders of the European Union, was once reputed to have said, if I were to do it again from scratch, I would start with culture. Creative Europe, the European Commission's framework program to support the culture and audiovisual sectors, is the embodiment of Monet's declaration. Programs such as the European Capitals of Culture and the European Union Prizes for Literature, Architecture, and Heritage, and funding for various programs in the cultural sector have placed culture and cultural diplomacy on an important stage in EU policymaking. Today, I'm joined by a panel of experts and practitioners to discuss the EU's cultural policy initiatives and governance, the European cultural economy, and the implications of these for European identity and solidarity. Our first panelist is uh, Randall Halle, who is the Klaus W. Jonas Professor of German Film and Cultural Studies at the University of Pittsburgh. He directs the Critical European Culture Studies Program. His essays have appeared in journals such as Europe Now, Screen, the International Journal of Cultural Policy. He's the author of, among others, German Film After Germany, Toward a Transnational Aesthetic, the Europeanization of Cinema, Interzones and Imaginative Communities, and Visual alter alter Alterity, Seeing Difference in Cinema. His research is focused now on short films and the European idea, as well as the pineapples of exotic Pittsburgh. I really like that title. Uh, next, I'm pleased to welcome uh, Klaas Gavoss, who is uh, an assistant professor at the, at the Department of European Studies at the University of Amsterdam. Her research focuses on the forms of governance, EU, investment, EU investments in cultural uh, produce. How is culture governed in Europe and what does that entail? What are the technologies of power at play that change dealings with culture on a European level? What are the consequences of these new forms of governance and to what forms of negotiation, exchange, and friction do they lead to? She looks at these questions particularly in non-EU settings. In her current HEA, HERA network project, she examines grassroots cultural work and practices of self-governance amongst cultural workers in Southeast Europe. Next, I'm pleased to welcome Philip Schlesinger, who is professor in cultural theory at the University of Glasgow, where he works in the Center for Cultural Policy Research and also CREATE, the UK Copyright and Creative Economy Center. He is a cultural and media sociologist who's worked regularly internationally in interdisciplinary research teams. Currently, he is researching the regulation of internet platforms and also the political sociology of cultural expertise. He has published on diverse European topics, including nationalism and collective identities, the possibility of a European public sphere, and EU cultural and creative economy policies. He's been a visiting professor at universities in France, Italy, Norway, and Spain. And last but certainly not least, I'm pleased to welcome Ivan Sharar, who is head of the Department of Culture of the city of Rijeka in Croatia, which is a 2020 European capital of culture. He holds a degree in psychology from the University of Rijeka and completed postgraduate coursework in marketing at the Faculty of Economics in Zagreb. He has spent his professional career in the fields of cultural and creative industries. He has been the head of, of the Department of Culture in Rijeka since 2011 and led the city's bid to be designated as a European capital of culture. He is currently the president of the supervisory board of Rijeka 2020. 
He has been awarded for his work in the marketing and advertising fields, as well as in the music industry. And he is an honorable lifetime member of the Croatian Music Union. Welcome everyone today uh, to our discussion. I'm very pleased to have all of you here. I'd like to start out with a, a, a general question, um, thinking about uh, the EU's cultural agenda and whether the EU does have a cultural agenda. So I'd like to sort of do a tour and see uh, what everyone's uh, thoughts are on this. Um, and I'll have Randall, if you don't mind starting. <clears throat> I'll mute myself. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I'm fine. The, you know, and in fact, actually, um, uh, JJ, the, the quote from Jean Monnet, I think is interesting because it seems to suggest that uh, the project is something that wasn't there at the beginning, that it had to be reset. And, and indeed, that's not the case. And uh, really from the start, uh, I think all the founding fathers were oriented, founding fathers, founding figures were oriented towards thinking about culture and the, the idea of small steps in the economy um, developed uh, it, its own weight. Uh, but, but really from the start, uh, the creation of European schools, um, the, the idea of where Ivan is, uh, the idea of the cities of culture was something that already emerged in the 70s. And, and so there, there have been this long-term commitment to the development of culture. And I think one of the things that's interesting for us to consider is how creative and culture industries has become a way of thinking about culture as intersecting uh, with economy and politics. But, but, and the final thing I'll just say uh, as starting out, I think one of the problems in general uh, is, however, that culture in a European context, especially in the notion of subsidiarity, doesn't necessarily look like the production of a European culture, but rather it's always intersecting um, and in fact, actually returning to the national levels, uh, the local levels, and um, not necessarily coming back per se to, to um, um, the EU uh, in a big splashy fashion. So Ivan might have a lot to say about the way that that looked, uh, especially in 2020 and in, in the conditions that we had, but, but I'll stop here. Great, thank you. Um, I'll just go around it where you are on my screen. Uh, Klaska, would you like to, to jump in? Sure. Yes, I mean, uh, I, I would agree with, with Randall. It, it has an agenda, even though you might think, you know, in many ways that the European Union does not have that many competences, you know, the development of many products are in the hands of many actors. Yet there is a vision behind culture. And some of these visions have, I would say, remained the same from its early start. Huh? That idea that culture can help uh, thicken European identity, create a European community, it's still very much there. But it's also very much there in the different agendas for culture. I think, you know, the fact that they have an agenda for culture or a work plan for culture says enough, I think. There is an idea of what culture should do. Uh, and indeed, whether that's actually happening is, is, is another thing. And this is changing over the years. I would say now, if you look at the most recent plan, we have attention for digitalization. We have attention um, for um, cultural diplomacy as something that needs to be stimulated. Or um, we even have the Green Deal, I saw, as part of you know, environmental uh, use of culture uh, is part of many projects, which has not been on the agenda in the early years. So we see that culture is following the EU agenda at large and fits into the demands of the budget period. And in that sense, I would say, yeah, there is an agenda what happens afterwards, yes, we'll talk about that later is another thing, but there's definitely an agenda that the European Union has, which culture it has to, because it also has to legitimize the budget it spends. You know, it, it has to tell what it's at least intentionally um, used for. Great, thank you. Uh, Ivan, you wanna give your perspective on this? Yes. Uh, my answer is uh, Europe, uh, have agenda, but uh, this agenda is very complicated. It's a multi-speed, multi-level agenda different for every uh, country. Uh, I think uh, it's wrong to think that that agenda is serious uh, uh, cultural policy because uh, from the first, and of course, based perspective, uh, and that's budgeting, uh, from perspective of Rijeka, I think 
the basic perspective is local because our cultural system is between 80 and 90 percent of total budget is uh, paid by local uh, taxpayers and uh, second level is national which is around uh, somewhere between five and ten percent and european union uh, uh, have big impact in case of croatia because we are some kind of undevelopment part of europe and we are receiving uh, uh, money not for, for culture, but for structural and social uh, uh, cohesion with uh, uh, developed part uh, of Europe. And uh, that tool is not used by uh, uh, France or Germany or Netherlands or uh, uh, old, old members which are rich enough and they don't need any kind of uh, uh, big investments European agenda. Uh, what is important in European uh, cultural policy is insisting uh, that uh, culture is a tool, I think in the last two fin financial perspectives, and Euro European Union uh, succeed in one uh, a crazy way, uh, like uh, 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 Joseph Stalin 70 uh, or, or 60 years ago, we have uh, something which is totally crazy from uh, a state's perspective. We have seven years uh, uh, financial perspectives, which are seven years of priorities in, in budgeting, which is definitely the same thing as uh, USSR planning of uh, everything. Everything is very rigid. Everything is uh, 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 in maximalistic way uh, uh, bureaucratic. But as I said, we are using that uh, uh, tools. Uh, City of Rijeka uh, received somewhere between 20 and 25 million euros in the last three years for investing in infrastructure. But uh, uh, that still doesn't mean that that European cultural policy have big impact because uh, especially in that age of populism and right wing increasing uh, uh, cultural policy is uh, even culture is financing locally cultural policy is something which is very uh, uh, important for national pride, for uh, 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 warming up uh, 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 a, a local and uh, national proud. And if you imagine that uh, in scale of uh, 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 people, European Union is, well, not uh, uh, two times bigger than the United States, but uh, uh, like two times bigger with 30 different countries with uh, different languages with that complicated history. It's, as I said at the beginning, uh, multi-layering, multi-speed, totally diverse policy uh, 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 with some catches, catch can uh, uh, combination for every, every nation. And we are playing that complicated games because there are some money inside. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And I think you, you, you raised several interesting um, avenues that we can continue sort of discussing, including, you know, sort of the, as you say, sort of this multi-speed, multi-level, often how we talk about Europe, but just some of the, the variations in, you know, sort of the, the, the funding and even sort of perhaps the influence of any sort of agenda that the EU has by those that are are recipients of of those of that funding as well. So we'll we'll circle back to that um, in in a bit. Um, Philip, do you want to round this out with your your thoughts on this? Oh, and unmute yourself. Yes, I'd uh, I'd be delighted to add uh, my penny's worth. Um, I, I think I think um, the, of course the, the the formal systems have been talked about. I mean that there is there is a, a cultural agenda, uh, there is an overall cultural policy, and increasingly, of course, there is. Uh, creative industries policy and it's really worth putting all of this into perspective because the European Union spends just around one percent of its uh, total budget on culture and that really hasn't changed it, it's gone up substantially uh, I suppose in relation to the creative Europe program which is the centerpiece which brings together uh, media uh, cultures traditionally understood and, and a number of other uh, cross-cutting activities but it's a very small cultural spend and of course as has been pointed out it's a relatively small cultural spend which can have disproportionate effects as Ivan has has said but but uh, it's it's small because um, 
the, the subsidiarity of the member states means that they are effectively the, the major cultural agents. Um, I think it's also useful to put um, some of the changes in thinking in European Union policy in relation to perceptions of threat and changes in uh, global geopolitics. And um, I certainly recall just very few years ago that you know the United States under President Trump was being quietly talked about as a potential enemy by Eurocrats, although they would deny this in, uh, in any sort of public forum, and uh, equated in many ways to, to Russia. So there's, there's that sort of sense of being squeezed between poles, which I think um, has engendered a certain amount of urgency and a certain amount of concern about culture, looking outwards from a soft power point of view. But at the same time, it hasn't really transformed anything because the very structures of the European Union uh, are inimical to making it much more important. So there's a way in which I think by supporting um, uh, processes such as the European uh, Cities of Culture, um, the cultural policy works as much uh, uh, as a kind of a, a form of internal uh, reallocation of resources as it does to create uh, the, the much vaunted solidarities, which is which, which are supposed to be uh, at the root of it. Great, uh, thank you. And I think that's very important because as we talk about, you know, all of these, these programs and sort of the importance of culture, I think it's important to sort of bring this back down to the, to the, to the fact that the EU doesn't spend that much money itself on, on culture and in terms of what percentage of its, of its overall budget. And then the, and the fact that it is, as you use the, the sort of, the term that's commonly in this to use this idea of subsidiarity and then it is thrown back to the mem to the member states as well and so we do see sort of somewhat perhaps of an agenda setting role by the eu but in terms of the um actual um administration and you know uh what this actually looks like on the ground that that's largely at the member state level um so i see yvonne and then randall have have your hands up so if you want to yvonne uh, jump in here uh, just small reaction because uh, talking when you are talking about culture, the talking about money is the best way. Uh, uh, only follow the uh, uh, follow the money. As Philip said, the uh, uh, less than one percent of uh, European Union budget is dedicated to culture. The same thing is in Croatia on national level. Less than one percent of national budget is dedicated to culture, but in city level in Rijeka, last three years, of course, because of expansion. Uh, with the European Capital of Culture, our cultural budget was 21% of total city budget. Uh, uh, the normal share is between 11 and 12%, which is totally eccentric and bizarre from uh, uh, states' perspective, because uh, uh, budget for culture, including 550 employees in institutions the city owned two theaters two museums library uh, art cinema etc et and uh, that is good example what culture in europe still means we are very old school conservative we have uh, as i said 550 employees on city taxpayers pay payrolls and now during the lockdown, when uh, a lot of uh, institutions are, are closed, all these people are receiving their salaries, our opera orchestra, our ballet. And uh, 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 that's the example, what is the difference between local perspective, local cultural policy and the local budgeting with uh, uh, compared with that uh, uh, smaller than 1% of total EU or, or, or national budget. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think that that is a striking difference, which I'm glad you, you point, pointed that out as well. Randall, do you want to jump in? And I do think, I mean, just uh, as an American, uh, per se, I, I think one of the things that's interesting is when we talk about cultural policy uh, in a country in which there is the U.S. situation, in which there's basically no government funding for culture. Um, that's one thing that just to underscore that my colleagues are, are, are talking very differently than the way that we would talk about culture in the United States per se. Uh, 
And I just want to underscore that for me, one of, one of the things as a, as a, um, from my perspective that is a little bit odd in the conversation is when a bridge is built um, in um, Zagreb uh, that has both the EU flag and the Croatian flag on it, uh, it strikes me as that's something that, that could be taken up as a question of culture. Um, because it is presenting a symbol of the European Union in a particular way. But if we're going to talk about the Creative Europe program and uh, culture in a very narrow fashion, and then, and then we're not talking about opera, um, we're not talking about poems, but we're rather talking about things like translation and other kinds of sector production, then it becomes interesting to me because the EU, and, and my area of course is, uh, of expertise is really within film and media, the EU has the possibility to produce effects in the audiovisual sector that are not explicitly about funding per se, but about drawing together production in synergistic ways. And so something like if Ivan wanted to, we could, we could talk about the Europa Cinemas Network, which once funding the Europa Cinemas to um, redesign themselves, to refurbish themselves, they're not necessarily getting a lot of money from the European Union anymore, but they create a venue in which in um, Croatia, a German film or a Dutch film will be screened. Uh, and that profitability is something that is directly related to the, uh, the infrastructure that's created by uh, Creative Europe, by the, by the media program. And, the, and, and that goes back to my uh, in, immediate observation about bridges, because that's the kind of infrastructure of culture and the possibilities of cultural consumption that are there that don't need to continue to be uh, funded, uh, or for that matter, at the Berlin Film Festival, when the Creative Europe desk is set up to assist in co-productions, um, those co-productions don't actually get necessarily money uh, from Creative Europe per se in large numbers, but, but Creative Europe has created a condition in which a sound crew from Rotterdam can work together with a uh, filmmaker from Antwerpen uh, on a French-Belgian co-production, right? And, and those are all, again, infrastructural situations that allow for the flourishing of an audiovisual sector. I'll just, it looks like Philip has something to add in here. And, and, I, and I do, I do want to point also, Klaske uh, should be able to tell us about the way that, say, EU cultural policy can be used uh, within the ascension states or in the post-ascension states to, to create kinds of, um, uh, I, I, she, I, I teach her work on that. So, so I'm just going to give a shout out there. Uh, we will get to that, not to worry, but that, yes. <laughs> um, Philip. Uh, well, thanks. Um, yes, um, uh, far from um, an ascension state, this is um, um, an, an, exi an exited state that I live in, uh, <laughs> lamentably, and uh, it, it's extremely interesting, you know, how, how very rapidly uh, Europe has become another space um, in, in the public discourse, um, you know, somewhere else as it was, uh, be well, be you know, before uh, British membership of the of the European Union. Um, really just to pick up on, on what Randall was saying, I, I, I don't in any way um, decry the, the importance of these um, co-productions and investments in, in art house cinema, particularly art house cinema, and the ways in which those cultural flows are importantly constitutive of certain kinds of relations. But I think we need to get it in perspective as well and Hollywood rules uh, still is the case, you know, whether it's whether it's streaming or whether it's, uh, you know, once we get back to, to getting inside the cinemas, the overwhelming consumption of audiovisual product across Europe is not European products by Europeans, it's very much uh, US products by Europeans. So I think we need to, to, to kind of just think about that. And also in terms of the symbolism of uh, the, the EU flag or the support for works. I think the, you know, these are important, but I think it's also again, uh, a bit like with the European city of culture. Uh, and here I, I speak from one place that was a city of culture 30 years ago. It, you, you, you cannot really 
uh, exaggerate uh, the 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 long term implications. That it, it's very very difficult to assume that a one off produces a change in consciousness, uh, and uh, you know without uh, continued reaffirmations of a certain kind of collective belonging, um, that 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 these kinds of interventions are really going to be that impactful. And I think also, you know, I, I, I note with, with irony that this is supported by Erasmus Plus, which the United Kingdom has pulled out of, again, lamentably. And, you know, how wonderful it is to be supported by Erasmus Plus when my own state will no longer have that relationship with Erasmus Plus. Yes, we all are, are all about irony as best, as best we can. Uh, Klaska, you want to uh, jump in? Yeah, I'll, I'll be short, but I'm also thinking, you know, of, of, in terms of, you know, the effects or whether the agenda really touches ground or anything alike. But I think also from my experience, a lot of what the European Union is doing is complementing either what's already there. Huh? So you all often have a lot of networks, theatre companies, dance, you know, uh, companies that used to cooperate on a European level, you know, already uh, since they, for example, started their production and the Creative Europe is just another means next to a range of other means to be able to develop projects. And in that sense, it's a, it's a very welcome addition to what's out there. And I think that's the same for, for film or that's the same for um, many others. And if I look in, and we'll talk about that later, I know in, in, in the condition of, for example, states like Bosnia or Serbia or Macedonia, where I'm, I'm working in, it's also really an opportunity to move outside of local contexts, you know, and to work in these partnerships. I'm not saying it's easy. It's very difficult. There's also confrontation with many discrepancies at play in that field. So, so it, it, it goes in, in many directions, but it does complement what's there. And it's one of the many means. Uh, and yes, the budget is small, but it does, you know, in that sense, um, complement, I would say, um, these developments. Yeah, thank you. No, I think I think that that give and take is really, really important. Um, I want to step back for a minute um, for um, those of our audience who may not be familiar with some of these programs that um, that we've all we've been referring to um, and talk just a bit about kind of nuts and bolts a little um, in terms of the Creative Europe program and what it is, how um, how uh, uh, how funding is accessed, the kinds of things, and we've all you've all sort of mentioned a few things that are funded, and then obviously turn to the the European Capitals of Culture um, program itself, and 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 hear from Yvonne. So, who would um, of you would like to jump in um, and and talk a little bit about kind of the the program itself? Um, anyone like to offer their <laughs> Klaska, Would you like to? You know, I'm happy to to to, to start because okay, it's not great. an easy thing. Yeah. yeah. I think we can help each other. Exactly. We can work together to paint yeah, a picture yeah, I, I of, of what this is. Before, let's not, you know, get trapped in the European language, you know, right. democracy, and we <laughs> get there as we get into these nuts and bolts. But I think a few things, you know, um, are probably important to to highlight when we talk about because you particularly talk about funding, huh, and how that works within this Creative Europe program, huh? if, mm -hmm. I, if I get it right. Sure, and how you know, exactly how funds are accessed by individuals, by a theater yeah. company, for example, you know, that those kinds yeah. of things. Yeah, I, I think this this is immediately a question of where do you apply for? Uh, where do you, mm -hmm. because I think it offers, and Philip, I think was saying that already offers a range of programs. You have the division between media, division between culture, and then there are a few other programs and they all have their, you know, particular audiences, particular application rounds and, and goals, I would say in itself. So I think that is where it starts. It depends on, on what you look at. And I think what Ivan was saying is very important. Uh, the European Union only funds a percentage, you know, of the different projects that are, that are offered. So in many ways, everyone can apply for this kind of fund. For example, if you look at what I'm focusing on, the cooperative strand, it's partnerships between cultural workers from different European countries. They decide to write a project proposal, send it to you know, in this case, the agency that is responsible for that. And then, you know, they will look at the report and see if all the nuts and bolts of that particular proposal are in place, you know, and that is a long process, very bureaucratic. And I think that is a slightly different, for example, when you look at literature translations, these will be publishing houses, mm -hmm. or if you look at the film houses, you know, so different actors apply, but they can just 
uh, send their proposals, their open calls. And these mm -hmm. open calls are announced on a regular basis and you apply um, for that. But, you know, I think applying is one thing then you have to make sure that you find a co-funder. You know, there are a lot of things mm -hmm. uh, attached to that. It does not stop by you just apply for a project, you get your fund and you develop your project. I think that is quite um, important. And maybe I'll hand over the stick to someone else. <laughs> and, and if I can add to it later, I will. But that's just the start of Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> no, no, absolutely. And I think the process in some ways, it mirrors you know, our own process in the US of applying for, for, for EU funding through Erasmus Plus. Horizon well. is very similar. Um, yes. And Horizon 20, exactly. Yeah. So <laughs> the, the process itself. Um, uh, Ivan, and then Randall. So a few words, of course, on very uh, practicing level uh, creative europe is complicated it insists on a lot of networking uh, 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 much as, as much partners you have uh, and in more complicated way it, it, it's better it's good to uh, to follow the, the 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 hot topics of uh, uh, ongoing uh, uh, policy well, uh, gender topics, minority topics, green topics, smart city topics, blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, They're insisting on uh, some kind of intersectoral frame, which is hot uh, now. And I think less than one half of percent of applicants will receive money. They're expecting national and local uh, matching, as, as Klask has said. And uh, if I try to translate it to, to state's perspective, uh, you need one partner from Idaho, one from North uh, Carolina, one from Florida, two from uh, Arizona, and one, I don't know, uh, uh, well-being uh, Vermont or Maine people, which are uh, including some uh, a different type of diversity, and, and that's fine. And then you create some topic around uh, LGBT people, how to, to foster cooperation between different cultures and, and, and everything is created to, to, uh, to create a lot of mobility, a lot of uh, interconnections between different cultures and everything is saturated with, uh, with uh, ongoing uh, uh, policy and, and, and politics, which, which is not uh, uh, bad. Uh, the worst part of Creative Europe is which uh, that programs are so difficult to uh, administrate that reports are killing all, inclu including partners. And from uh, uh, my perspective, from Croatian perspective, I, I know a lot of uh, very uh, successful applicants for Creative Europe. Uh, my opinion is that uh, not most innovative and most creative cultural and uh, uh, artistic workers are uh, successful ones, not the best bureaucrats, uh, 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 the best planners, the masters of Excel tables are uh, uh, the people who are receiving Creative Europe uh, money. And I think the, uh, that European Union needs some move on in uh, uh, the general idea of uh, open calls and, uh, and, and this uh, bureaucratic part of creative Europe, because uh, I think it's uh, much more and more uncreative Europe. It is, uh, uh, let's enjoy complicated bureaucracy Europe, which is killing itself. Uh, I'm only laughing because we experience the <laughs> much of the same in many of the um, Funding schemes that we apply for um, uh, as a as a third as a third party in the U.S. I know situations where uh, NGOs have uh, four administrators and one creative guy because administration is everything and creation as well. Mm -hmm. as a smaller part of it. <laughs> yes. No. As I said, this echoes. <laughs> this is very familiar, um, and, and you know, in a different in a different context. But I think the the, the point that you made, um, and then I'll, I'll I'll turn it over to to Randall and to Philip, is this the focus on mobility and the focus on having partners from across member states. Um, I think that's a really um, important important to sort of point out in terms of the goal of the program. Um, and if we think of you know sort of European programs that are trying to foster 
um, this elusive European, you know, solidarity and uh, Europeanness and things like that, right? Setting up a program in the way that Creative Europe has, at least structurally, that's in fact what it's, you know, what it's trying to do. Again, with all of the hurdles that you mentioned as well, but the need to have multiple, uh, you know, individuals from multiple member states, um, etc., of really, you know, sort of forcing that idea of kind of a of of of, of European you know identity and 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 solidarity as well. So um, again, complicated with the things you mentioned, of course. Um, so uh, Randall, I just I, I, everything that's said, I, I, I couldn't rhyme in, and I, I think what's interesting for me is just a little bit of a historical insertion uh, into the conversation, and that is Klaska already noted that there are different units within Creative Europe. There's the culture program and the media program, and those are in effect um, there because there's, they're almost historical legacies. And then before Creative Europe became the umbrella organization, there were um, the, the media program and the culture program were separate and distinct, and the culture program had already become an umbrella organization for other programs. And, and that's only important in so much as I think within that history, there were transformations that took place. And the audiovisual sector in the 90s in particular was something that was very national and very uh, small based. And the media program helped create this kind of mobility that we're talking about. But the funding was largely going more towards individuals uh, for training and for projects. And when the Creative Europe program came into place as the umbrella organization, this kind of shift that Ivan uh, and you are identifying, uh, what we saw was a move to funding production companies and, and pr precisely production companies as those which are the ones who know how to do the spreadsheets. And the bigger the production company, the more likely you're going to get, or as Klaska said uh, with um, uh, publishing houses. So rather than, than going to, and, and many of us might have in our heads with the idea of culture that the, that the writer or the director or the, the local uh, ballet company should be getting it, that's actually then become all the more difficult because of the way that the funding has sort of taken over uh, to, make it, to, to make it such that you really need to make arguments and you need to be inserted into a professional structure. And I think then the other, one of the other outcomes of that has been that there's been formats and, and um, companies themselves that have emerged to be part of the funding structure, right? So, so you want funding, come to us, we'll help you get the funding. And then they, they have become a kind of secondary way of creating, if you want, you need an LGBTQ, uh, angle to this, and then we can get you the funding. And so you might not originally have had an interest in LGBTQ um, uh, questions, but suddenly you have a trans person in your story because um, that's the way that you'll get the funding. And then that, that can change the nature of what's being made, not necessarily in a, in a quote unquote authentic way. Mm -hmm. That's a, yeah, I think that's a really interesting perspective of how the funding structure has influenced not only you know who who is uh, likely to apply in the sense of those that have more of the infrastructure, and that's also not only the organizations, but we can think of you know, at the country level, right, where there's the infrastructure and that sort of thing. But I think the point that you make of how that is actually influencing the creation, because more likely to be funded if you have X and we'll find X for you to put into, you know, that sort of thing is a really interesting um, effect as well in terms of, you know, how substantively the funding is actually affecting the creation as well. Um, oh, I'm glad there's so much interest in this topic. So uh, Philip, and then I think, uh, um, I think Yvonne and then Klaska, yeah. Oh, you're still muted, Philip. Uh, I'd just like to pick up on um, you know, one or two of the points that have been raised, because I, I think um, from the point of view of, an, of, of somebody who lives in a state that's exited, the, the, the real value added of the European framework is more and more apparent. And um, 
for example, uh, visa problems are now an issue for creatives who would mm -hmm. normally travel in both directions. And, and uh, this is going to create bottlenecks and it's going to create uh, a diminution of, 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 of cultural output and, and connections. And uh, we know this is particularly affecting musicians, uh, but it's also affecting the fashion industry. And you know, there's, there's interesting work beginning to show a very, very rapid impact because we're now thinking, I mean, we're, we're, we're three, four months down the line, that's all. And uh, we know that um, the, the, the counterpart of mobility is immobility. And, and, and uh, this, is, this is what we're dealing with. So I think, I think that actually is a really important um, dimension for those who are still within the European Union to take on board, because I, I think it sort of underlines the, the value of, of, of the framework that's been created. I think a second point really, which we haven't talked about very much is the way in which, but it's, it's been implicit in everything we've said, is the way in which um, cultural policy is very much an economic policy. And one of the really significant shifts in the thinking of uh, the commission and, and the parliament over the past decade or so has been to embrace um, creative industries thinking. So. Uh, and, and, you know, we don't need to go into the history of, of that a great deal, but it's become, um, it's become aligned alongside thinking about culture. And uh, it, it's, it's thought about in, in, in terms of employment, it's thought about in terms of soft power, and there, there are some very, very characteristic tropes which define that approach to thinking about culture, which is, uh, it, there's always a tension between its instrumentalization, if you like, for for profit and and for the building of uh, of of the of the state, uh, and at the same time there are tensions with culture conceived intrinsically. And I think um, creative Europe is a, is a, is a nexus for a lot of that uh, unresolved debate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Ivan. Uh, short comment on uh, uh, Randall. Uh, what is some kind of paradox of creative Europe? Uh, if you are from Southeastern Europe, uh, former Yugoslavia or Romania or Bulgaria, is the uh, situation that in our national uh, legislative is much better to have public institution for every cultural field you want to improve. And uh, uh, if you want to have symphonic orchestra, you have public institution. And for a lot of Creative Europe open calls, public institutions are not acceptable partner. The uh, biggest, well, not uh, the whole budget, but the biggest part of Creative Europe is dedicated to NGOs. And uh, at, at the same way, uh, uh, it's impossible to empower institutions, that's the first problem. And the second problem is that uh, NGOs are uh, going with the flow, as I said before. Uh, uh, I think the best way is to, to, to have example. Uh, two years ago, some uh, a Roma guy, we have the Roma ghetto in, in, in Rijeka, called me and totally in panic and so all the uh, strange people called us for partnership, uh, uh, some uh, cultural producers, what's going on? And I, I'm going to, <laughs> to Google. And uh, uh, of course, one uh, Creative Europe open call uh, uh, started. I think the, uh, uh, the basic topics was most fragile minorities in your area. And all NGO producers jump in in, in, in a Roma ghetto and want them for, <laughs> for partners, <laughs> people and cultural producers which never had serious, creative, and uh, uh, deep aesthetic interest to have co-productions with Roma people. But of course, when money is around fragile minorities, let's go inside the Roma culture <laughs> and organize some, some interesting projects. Well, uh, one way, it's, it's good and it's interesting, but uh, it shows you how paradoxical and bizarre is some uh, 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 European Union culture policy, which is applied through Creative Europe uh, uh, open calls. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. <laughs> That's really interesting in terms of, of 
yes, the sort of, I suppose, the good and the, and, and the bad or not, you know, uh, as well. Um, maybe not bad, but just, uh, you know, again, going back to sort of how the, the call is, uh, you know, uh, creating the, having a substantive effect on the creation itself, which is, which is quite interesting. I think, Klaska, you had a hand up at some, some point. Sorry yeah, if some I, <laughs> Sorry. I, I think it still works, but maybe it's a bit more in relation to, to another topic as well, you know, because we're talking about how projects have become economic in, in nature, or I would say how the impact on the diverse application of the program. Mm -hmm. And of course, one of the big objectives of the program is to, you know, invest in, in cultural diversity and, and the like. And I think there's an interesting tension here that is related to these funding procedures that we just talked about. We have, you know, a large amount of very successful applicants that are also, I would say, based in particular parts of Europe. Eh? If you look at the graphs, you have Italy, it's, you know, it's, it, it gets a lot of projects or uh, a few others. So we see actually due to these funding schemes and who is able, either in terms of knowing the language, the tricks, having the resources, because I know from, and that must be similar in Croatia, but, but from Serbia, Bosnia, you know, th there's simply a lack of resources. Very often one person is representing one project in the country and has to do all the work, you know, so it's, it's impossible for them to lead a project even if they want it. While others have indeed a whole staff in place where indeed we have one creative thinker and the rest is doing all the administrative work. So these discrepancies, I would say, in, have an immediate impact also in the outcome of the kind of project that are funded. And in, I, I completely agree with Ivan, and particularly in, in what I've seen in the NGO sector in Southeastern Europe, but this is not, I'm, I'm sure this is not particular from this reg region, maybe a bit worse than elsewhere. Many very, I would say, innovative projects simply do not get through because they do not have the capacity, which has nothing to do with the content of the program mm -hmm. or how it might fit, you know, to the objectives of the career program, um, uh, but much more with other things. And I think there is, there is an interesting uh, dynamic uh, going on there, but mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I'm, I will leave it to this now. And there's so much to say about it. But sure, yeah. sure, no, thank you. Uh, Randall. So um, even almost as I can phrase this as a perhaps direct questions to Ivan and Klaska, because Philip, Philip just mentioned the success of the uh, creative and culture industries model. And I think on the one hand that is successful, but I think it also uh, within the context of creative Europe, but it doesn't necessarily mean that in terms of cultural policy on the national level, that all the member states uh, are explicitly oriented towards a creative and culture industry model. And, and I think um, if you look at where the ministries of culture are located in the various countries or how they're framed, uh, England's ministry of culture is um, culture and sport and tourism, if I'm not mistaken, whereas in Philip, you can correct me, but 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 and 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 I believe in Hungary or Poland, it's it's a national resource and and a, in a very different model of thinking about it, and that goes to perhaps a direct question here: How do we see those in various parts? And we're already starting to, to identify that, that that in various regions or in various countries, that really has an impact on the way then um, Italy. Uh, would, of course, in many ways have uh, success in applying to a creative and culture industry model. But I also would underscore that if creative and culture industry models are successful, there's also another quasi-national model that has been successful uh, in defining European uh, EU-level cultural policy, and that's the French model, uh, in which the cultural exception uh, has been there to also protect uh, the cultural production from uh, certain kinds of direct competition. And so Philip also earlier mentioned Hollywood, but, it, but I think that, that the cultural exception at least has made it such that there's a different playing field when Europeans uh, go into a transnational or a global level of production, that there's, there's some sort of um, protection for culture as opposed to simply a free market reign, uh, which might otherwise be, uh, have been pushed through by the World Trade Organization, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, Philip, you wanna jump in? Yes, yeah, sorry, um, the, the, the boring title of, of the, uh, the, the culture uh, ministry is digital 
culture, media, and sports. So uh, you know, it's got it's got everything except um, I, I'm not quite sure what. Um, <laughs> but just just to kind of pick up on the the cultural exception, um, I think there has been a really interesting shift, and and this really takes us to questions of international trade because the the cultural exception really has been retreated from by uh, the EU, and it's replaced it with uh, a much weaker kind of defense, which is the, the UNESCO Convention on the Diversity of Cultural Expressions. And um, so we, we, we are sort of somewhere in, in, a, in a stasis on, on major cultural trade negotiations with the United States. Um, when, when I say we, the European Union is anyway. And um, it, the, the, these kind of the, the question of, um, if you like, new technologies and their relationship to contents is, is hugely complicating um, whatever those future negotiations are going to be. So um, I think the cultural exception is, um, you know, it's, it, it, it hangs over from a previous era of about 20 years ago. And um, the next round of trade negotiations when it comes and inevitably it will, uh, is gonna be much, much tougher in respect of uh, cultural expression. And indeed, when there was a chance of the uh, transatlantic um, trade negotiations occurring just at the start of uh, President Trump's period in office, uh, there was a huge amount of militancy, uh, defensive militancy against the thought that the United States might completely undermine uh, European models of cultural um, support, actually. So um, that's, that's still on the agenda, I would say. Yeah, no, thank you. And thank you for bringing in, you know, sort of the transatlantic piece to this. And we think, you know, we think we're talking obviously within the European context, but we obviously have to situate this in the, in the, larger, uh, in the larger context. Um, I, I want to turn now um, to um, a specific program within the Creative Europe program that we've been discussing, um, and that is the uh, cultural capital of city, European capital of, of culture, <laughs> excuse me, if I could actually get it correct, um, and uh, have Yvonne tell us a bit about um, this program, the, you know, sort of, you know, underlying kind of reasons, you know, Rieka applied, what, um, how that has, you um, uh, manifested itself obviously in a very unique year of pandemic of, as well. Of course, that's uh, it can't be <laughs> taken lightly. Um, and before I turn it over to Yvonne, I just wanted to, to mention to the audience um, at any point, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q and A, and I'll make sure to, to get to them. I know we have some uh, some other comments, of course, in the chat, and that's that's perfectly fine if you have things to share. Um, but please do if you have questions for our panelists on anything that we've been discussing or things that we may not get to. Um, that are on your mind um, related to these topics, please feel free to, to, to put that in the Q&A. So Yvonne, I will turn it over to you to give us a sense of, of, the, of, the, of that program. Okay. Uh, European Capital of Culture is, uh, well, maybe most famous uh, 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 cultural label in the European Union. Uh, it's, as everything in Europe, it's not uh, one way or one dimensional because uh, not in the same time, but in the same decade, uh, you have capital of culture as uh, Liverpool, Marseille, or Istanbul. Uh, uh, and in other line, you have no name cities in Hungary, Slovakia, or Croatia, because I don't have any doubt that you can, you can compare Istanbul and Rijeka as uh, European capital of culture. But well, that is the way European uh, uh, do, doing business. Uh, European capital of culture is... Uh, some kind of uh, strange program because European Union doesn't finance uh, anything seriously in, 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 in that program. Uh, every city received the so-called Melina Mercury Prize, which is somewhere around one and a half million euros. And at the same time, the European Commission expected that your budget is around 30 or 40 million euros. That means that, that uh, European Union participation is really <laughs> doesn't matter in your, your total budget. But there are a lot of uh, towns which are uh, uh, in the same way as Rijeka, which are using European capital of culture as tool of creating some local pride to change the uh, uh, image. And 
uh, uh, the basic idea in Rijeka was uh, typical European capital of culture idea, how to change image of uh, post-industrial town, which is some kind of troubled with, with transition. Uh, I think Liverpool is the best example of such European capital of culture because there really was troubled with the high unemployment rate, with uh, 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 catastrophic in the demographic situation. And uh, Rijeka was some kind of follower of Liverpool uh, model. Rijeka is, well, some strange city. It's, it's some kind of combination of foreign states. Uh, one way, uh, some cool city like San Francisco, uh, in the scene, uh, LGBT scene, uh, 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 in in Croatian or Balkan context, uh, left wing city uh, with a small amount of uh, nationalism and some conservative uh, way. But on the other uh, uh, way, on the other way, Rijeka is some kind of uh, Croatian Detroit because it was famous industrial town and all industry broke during the 90s. And uh, Rijeka really struggled hard for new image, for new identity. And uh, at the same time, uh, we are some kind of ugly duckling of Adriatic coast. We want to improve our uh, image in the uh, perspective of tourism, to boost some investments in new museums, new cultural facilities. And uh, we succeeded pretty well in our uh, uh, idea in that uh, infrastructural part. We built two new museums and city library and a few creative industries, co-working facilities. Uh, and that is the uh, successful part of our story. Of course, unsuccessful part is the uh, COVID catastrophics because uh, we uh, had to cancel or mid-sized on or uh, 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 big public uh, uh, events. We didn't organize anything uh, for more than 200 or 300 people, which means we canceled or uh, complicated international performing arts uh, programs. We focused on exhibitions because uh, the exhibitions are a COVID friendly part of uh, culture, cultural production. But at the same time, we, uh, we passed really well because our friends in Galway, which are uh, uh, another capital of culture in, in 2020, they didn't organize anything because Irish lockdown was, everything is closed whole year and uh, it's impossible to organize anything. And all three, uh, capital of culture in 2021 uh, uh, jumped to 2022 or 2023. And that means that Rijeka is the only one European capital of culture in 2020 and 21. And we are some kind of uh, COVID uh, European capital of culture survivor. I don't know it's good or it's only some pathetic way to how to survive that uh, uh, disaster, but we are at the end of uh, our story, we are uh, uh, European capital of culture till the end of April. We prepared a lot of programs for finishing and two days ago, uh, uh, our region uh, uh, opened uh, another one lockdown for two weeks and everything we prepared <laughs> is canceled one more time. And we are really frustrated, but in other way, we are satisfied with that infrastructural mm -hmm. and capital investment uh, success. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the way you describe Rijeka, I think also Pittsburgh is a similar uh, has a similar story as a post post industrial city, as well, um, and really thinking you know of, of re how we reinvent ourselves here um, as well. Um, and I think in Pittsburgh the focus has been largely on education and on um, the hospitals. So we talk about eds and meds in Pittsburgh um, in terms of moving from you know obviously a steel industry focused economy to one now focused on education um, and medicine. And we also have, not during COVID as much either, but a vibrant cultural um, environment as well. And that also ties back to, to our history in Pittsburgh as well and sort of the legacy um, of, uh, of, of many individuals at the turn of the last century as well. Um, so sort of this story of uh, rebirth and revival of cities is interesting tied to the European Capital of Cultures program and, and using that to sort of help facilitate that and send, and send that kind of signal as well. Um, let's see, I think Philip and then I think Klaska had her hand up as well. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, I, I, I just, just kind of like to kind of Add a, a historical perspective to this. I, as, it, as it happens, the, the Liverpool model, which was again 
rather like Pittsburgh and Rijeka, a sort of a post-industrial attempt to rebrand, uh, followed on from the Glasgow model. But the Glasgow model wasn't a model. It was kind of, it, it was happenstance. It was an accident. And it's really interesting looking back uh, 30 years uh, to see uh, just how much the whole effort to become a European capital of culture has professionalized. It really was not like that um, at that time. And uh, the model, the so-called model was stumbled upon and um, its legacy has been really quite questionable because there's not been a consistent cultural policy for the city ever since. And you might think that there would be. And, and I think it would be interesting in a way just to have that out as a, as a topic of conversation. Uh, the, the, the second point really has to do with the way in which, uh, aside from rebranding and possibly uh, causing some kind of modernization of cultural infrastructure, there really is some kind of impact on identity and consciousness of a city branding itself that way, because that is one of the fundamental purposes from the European Union's point of view. And I'm not at all convinced that that actually works um, to, to, to produce a lasting shift in how people think of themselves. Thank you for, for that perspective. And I think that, um, and Philip, you may have mentioned this earlier or, or perhaps someone else, I apologize, I don't remember who, but this idea of kind of these one-off, you know, sort of programs, not necessarily having any long-term impact, right? It's a very sort of short-term one-off fund this and then move on without sort of perhaps a long-term uh, agenda. And I think that that's, a, that's an interesting, you know, perspective from, from the Glasgow perspective as well. Um, Klaska. Yeah. Um I mean, now I, I was thinking also in, in now to respond a bit to what Philip was saying about indeed what is the long lasting effect huh, of these in, investments in cities and Ivan knows more about this, but I've, I've followed a few application processes in Bosnia, uh, Banja Luka and, and Mostar got pretty far in an application round and they really had to also submit plans for 10 years after the uh, the application so what you see really now is that the European Union is demanding ever you know longer overviews of what this might do in terms of you know the further development of municipalities and this also brings me to a point that I wanted to make earlier um, because we talk indeed about framing your city in certain ways you know as part of the the um, Capital of Culture program. And when I was speaking, for example, with the teams um, that were uh, ap applying for Mostar and Banja Luka, because technically they said we can never make it. Because if you look at Bosnia, if you look at our infrastructure, if you look at the resources, we will never fulfill the standards of the European Union. And this was sort of part of even you know, the, the process. The team primarily thought, let's apply for this program to at least make a strategy for our municipality, to at least start thinking in new ways, to at least trigger, bring people together. And it's a way of bringing people together. And this framework helps us, which was for me a very interesting thing, which I think is completely different for quite a few other European cities that have their structures in place, you know? And, and I think it's important to keep this also in mind. It can sometimes, you know, really trigger these and it really asks them to have a strategy in place with the region involved. And they didn't get it. Uh, I, I remember Böder got it, this Norwegian city in the Arctic somewhere, you know, that had everything in place in terms of finances and structure and, and everything everything, which of course was also a tremendous frustration for the applicants. But at the same time, you know, it offered a means to start changing thinking about how do you deal with your, your city in the next period, which is an interesting, I think, effect also of these programs. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Randall. Actually, I, I appreciate that. I'm sorry, Ivan. I'm, I'm going to have to leave in just a few minutes to go teach. And so I, I, this will be the last thing. But, but actually, it is interesting listening to this because the first city of culture was Athens, I believe, uh, in the city of culture model. And the, historically, the, it was this kind of celebration of then classic notions of the big city that is a cultural center. And so the shift that we're talking about really also aligns with the idea of creative industry and the sort of um, the guru behind Richard Florida with notions of improving infrastructure and gentrification through the creative class um, are, are all embedded in the thinking here 
And I, did, I wasn't aware of this 10-year plan out, but it really fits into that model. Uh, it also fits into a model of the festivalization of cities and the and we could talk about this in, in other critical ways vis-a-vis -vis sporting events uh, where the same sort of expectations of the World Cup or, or Olympics um, or on the smaller levels, those, those are there uh, as, as event culture and can or cannot actually drain the, the, the infrastructure of the city out and really orient a lot of what we're talking about here towards tourism. The, uh, the capitals of culture are also about creating new kinds of tourist networks. And, and that can be good. That can also be destructive in many ways to local economies, to local housing, uh, when Airbnb takes over. And all of those things just to put on the table and to say, uh, I don't want to go because this is a fantastic conversation and I really appreciate uh, what I've learned already from my co-panelists and, and, and you, JJ. So everybody be well and, and yeah, take care. Great. Thank you, Randall, very much. Um, Yvonne. Uh, just a few observations uh, about ECOC and that uh, project time spent. Well, this looks like one year festival, but uh, when you know that open call started seven years uh, before you are possible <laughs> eco candidate, which includes uh, long-term city strategy and field of culture, which include uh, two round bidding process because in every country you have six or seven, in Croatia we have nine uh, participants in first round, then their shortlist task to four, then two years more to next round, and uh, 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 designation is five years uh, before title, and then you have five years to prepare delivery, then one year of delivery, and then one or two year of uh, uh, creating bottom up and uh, waiting for expressions to, <laughs> to calm down. It's a <laughs> 10 years uh, process. It's huge earthquake in uh, cultural scene of every city. And I think every city after 10 years of shaking the scene uh, uh, will improve uh, one way or another uh, the cultural uh, life. And as uh, uh, Randall said, uh, European capital of culture really have deep impact of, of tourism. One really uh, a short example, uh, uh, Rijeka isn't uh, imported cruising destination, but last five or six years, we have some uh, uh, beginnings of cruising industry, five boats, seven, 15. And 2019, we have uh, uh, 19 cruisers and we have 46 announcements for 2020 because of capital culture. Of course, of course, we didn't have any cruiser last <laughs> year because the lockdown killed the cruising industry. But definitely, uh, European capital of culture, if you are in a suitable place for, for uh, uh, tourism, and Rijeka is definitely on, on, on hot spot because we are um, driving distance from Milan, Budapest, uh, Munich. Uh, we are really a, a accessible uh, destination. Uh, in, in that case, uh, European capital of culture is really powerful tool to improve uh, cultural tourism in a very long, uh, long time yet. Mm -hmm. No, thank, thank you. I think that's, yeah, that's important. The, the sort of the timeline of application, preparation, and then once you receive it, and then after reporting, and then all of these things. So I think that, yeah, that is, um, even if it is, you know, a, a one-off, you know, there is still a very long um, run-up and then, and then, and then uh, process afterwards as well. Um, and I think these connections, you know, that Yvonne, you talked about and Randall as well, but sort of the connection with, you know, culture, obviously in tourism, and of course, using um, the, the, the capital of culture designation to attract, you know, not in COVID, I realize everything is <laughs> very different, of course, but to attract, you know, to put, you know, the, a city on the map, so to speak, as you as you've said, and I think some of those examples. And so I think it's just very interesting, you know, to think about how the designation both is important 
you know, sort of internally and what that does internally in the country, but also sort of signaling externally as well in terms of um, the designation and what that means in terms of what the city is, ha has become um, as well um, and in both kind of the, the, the tourism economy, the cultural economy, all of those kinds of things as well. So I think that's uh, it's very interesting to to, to consider. Um, I want to um, turn now um, and actually just one more reminder to our audience. If you do have any questions, um, you know, please do do feel free to put them in, in, in the Q&A or the chat, um, comments, uh, etc. cetera, um, as we um, have about 15 minutes left of our discussion. Um, but I want to, you know, sort of uh, circle back um, to something that um, I think Randall mentioned and, and to specifically to Klaska. And I said, well, get back to sort of the role of um, cultural policy and the extension accession states um, and and we've touched on some of those um, some of those issues but if you could draw some of those connections as well kind of out of out of your own research um, that would be that would be great but should I answer immediately yeah so it yeah, was yeah. about okay. sorry yeah <laughs> I no, no, no. No, that's <laughs> wasn't completely no, 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 no. So you really talk about, you know, what are the strategies used and how do they play out in the, in mm -hmm. my case, enlargement context. Um, mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, it's, you easily get back to what we said at the start of this, of this um, session, namely, um, it's important to make some disclaimers first, you know, in, in many ways, the EU is, is limited in its competences, you know, and also limited in what it, what it does. Yet, I would say what I've seen and for example, I've been studying um, the impact of the Creative Europe program in, in, in Serbia and Bosnia, Macedonia and the like. I do think it has an impact. It does impact, it does change matters, um, not always in the ways intended by the European Union. I think this is very important and it does not always lead to identification with the European Union, but very often the other way around, a rather distanced position from the European Union in sense, this is not actually how we stand in, 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 in all of this, but it does impact in several ways. And first of all, and we talked about this already, adherence to funding criteria demands changes. Uh, and you, you gave the example of the, the Capital of Culture program, but this I would say counts for the for the for all the projects that have been implemented, you need to have your structures in place. Right? You need to make sure that it fits. And Randall was already saying, you know, these models of how you work with culture are not everywhere the same. And in particularly in the context of Serbia or Bosnia or Macedonia, this was a very difficult struggle for many actors to develop their projects in settings that did not link up with the sort of expectations of the you know, the, 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 let's say the, 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 the actors that made the funding schemes. Mm -hmm. So you see here that it did impact a lot on, you know, rethinking culture, learning new languages, really trying to, to evolve this. And I call it a new form of soft conditionality. Huh? You adhere to the criteria of the European Union in order to get your funding in this case, mm -hmm. which very often is, you know, in terms of accession, you get a step closer to European integration. In many mm -hmm. ways, I would say these funding criteria work in similar ways, you know, make sure that you adjust, then, you know, you might be able to get some funding in place. Another thing which is less negative, I would say, is that a lot of the projects demand partnerships. A lot of the projects demand that you cooperate with four or five or even more other European partners. You have to cooperate, you have to exchange. And this, of course, allows opportunities, in particular for actors in the region, to travel out of their country, to learn more about new approaches, to, you know, really work on new ways of thinking of culture, which are very difficult within their local settings, rather authoritarian settings, you know, where there are mm -hmm. hardly any opportunities to develop matters. So, so. You know, things are happening, but like I said, um, there is also a side effect of it that it, it, it creates um, really, um, I would say, resistance towards EU bureaucracy. It really looks at the European Union as a machinery, you know, so in terms of whether it creates identification or whether it brings about change in that sense. I think this is actually rather limited and those that feel that they um, can use the programs to become part of a wider European cultural space, most of the time we're already part of that space. Mm -hmm. uh, they already had their networks. They were already working on, on many projects. So it is important. And indirectly, I think through funding mechanisms, through demanding matters, it changes ways of thinking about culture. And I would say it also harmonizes a lot of the 
cultural projects. So it removes diversity from many of the projects. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking now about the eventual implementation. There you see diversity appearing, but mm -hmm. I do think there is definitely a, an impact here of the European mm -hmm. institutions in the setting I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, thank you. And I think this sort of echoes a lot of what we've been talking about yeah. in, in terms of how you know, the funding, you know, the funding schemes sort of structure themselves. Yeah. Um, and also, you know, they structure and then it, it is those that have been structured in a certain way that then are um, more able to receive the funding. So, um, mm -hmm. so thank you um, for that. So let's see, Yvonne and then uh, Philip, and we may, that may be the end at that point. We'll see. Yvonne, go ahead. Uh, just short comment on, on Klaska because she stressed the Bosnian cities uh, a few times. And one example how European Union uh, make mistakes. I don't know which year it was, but uh, I have contacted people from Tuzla because Tuzla in Bosnia is sister city yeah. with Rijeka and I have a lot of friends of Mostar. And I was deeply disappointed, of course, that is really hard for Bosnian city to, to deliver European capital of culture. But this year, uh, uh, every four years, uh, non-European Union cities can be designated as European capital of culture. That is example of Novi Sad in Serbia next year. But that year when Bosnian cities were bidding for European culture, European Commission picked Norway city for European capital of culture, which was totally shame from my perspective because uh, there is no uh, Norwegian city which needs anything to uh, for, for improve. And if uh, 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 when you are speaking between Norway and Bosnia, you choose Norway, I think you doesn't understand what is important uh, in European culture policy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a very, very good point. Yeah, Klaska. Yeah, just, just quickly, because it immediately impacts, I, I would fully agree with Ivan. Also, because what I really sensed that there was a need for an impetus you know, for a, a, a sign, you know, because most of these, and I don't know about the Rijeka situation, but I wouldn't be surprised if it's similar, because in, in, in Tuzla, Mostar, in all these cities, it's where they were the grassroots organization that pulled this, you know, that really wanted the change of the situation. And very often they're not backed up by the public institutions, you know, or those. And this was one final moment where they got together and managed to build something. And I'm sure if they would have gotten the wind in the back, you know, from the sort of EU funding perspective, this might have really brought some change and the impact indeed of having a no in these circumstances has been quite different than it would have been in case of Norway, of course. Mm -hmm. So I, I fully agree there, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Philip. Yeah, if I could just come in with uh, just a couple of observations, really, from a political science point of view, um, to do with your peonization. I think what we've just heard has been really, really interesting in terms of what we think about as um, incipient state construction, if you like. You know, on the one hand, we've been talking about bureaucratic learning. You learn the rules of the game. Doesn't doesn't necessarily have implications for your identity, but it has implications for your competence. And the second is networking, um, trans-border networking. Um, well, I have to say in my own case, I was working with people before any of these schemes ever came about, and I, I certainly intend to do so, um, you know, even though they come to an end largely for, for, for my own uh, state. But um, the, 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 there are questions there about the durability and meaning of these kinds of network and whether they are expedient in order to raise money or whether they have some kind of longer term consequence. And I think, you know, the, these are really, really key processes when you're looking at the long term creation of a new political formation, which is one aspect of what we're talking about, even though it's an extremely uncertain process. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for, for pointing that out. We are almost at the end of our time. I want to give everyone one final word. I know we, we of course, uh, did not get to everything, um, which I had uh, suspected we wouldn't since there, there are so many things to, to discuss. Um, and this was a, a wonderful conversation. But perhaps we could do a round of final, final thoughts if there's anything that you want to um, make sure that's uh, mentioned that hasn't been. Um, and uh, Klaska, if you want to, I'll put you on the spot first. <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. I'm just thinking of, there's so much that we've said, you know, in that. Um, um, what do I want to add to this? 
I mean, I, what I think is important, something that I do want to say is that I do think that, you know, these programs like the European Creative Programs, they're quite relevant. You know, I think we talk a lot about the caveats, you know, the problems, the issues at stake. And um, I think also if you, and we didn't touch upon that, that's completely, but if you look at the historical development of the Creative Europe program, you know, that has expanded massively. And we haven't even talked in this session about what the other uh, directorates generals of the European Union are doing, you know, and mm -hmm. they are also investing in culture and the many, you know, other projects. And, and Ivan was mentioning the regional, the pre-accession funds. I mean, they also invest in, in, in culture. So there's a lot um, going on. And, and what I always found interesting, you know, despite uh, many issues or, or many matters that we discuss now, it stays on the agenda. You know, there is obviously a, a belief that culture is something um, to add. And, and um, I would say um, sometimes it does more than it envisages. Maybe that's maybe the last thing I want to add to this, which is really what I see in my last research project about grassroots cultural work where I really see that local actors uh, develop amazing projects to develop new critical spaces within their local context. And I'm really talking now about Serbia or these countries where there's a really limited possibility to develop these kind of projects. And the Creative Europe does give them a lifeline, despite you know, many issues at stake, despite many, and I think, what needs what might be something um, um, interesting is also that more room for that can be created also within these kind of creative europe frameworks how can these programs be used otherwise so they fit better you know in relation to the targets or the uh, groups that actually apply for this funding there's often a mismatch but much more is going on than we sometimes see mm -hmm. no thank you thank you for that ivan Well, uh, you and I was uh, some kind of ignorant uh, around the European Union cultural poli policy. I think the culture is important part of uh, a lot of discourses in European Union. I think uh, we are learning a lot through all these uh, uh, international cooperations, especially we uh, wild people uh, from Balkans, because we need to improve our uh, our perception of cooperation, our our positioning in the European Union, because uh, it's obvious and it's clear that culture is important part, of course, uh, with, with business and a lot of diplomacy, uh, uh, that we have really peaceful situation in Europe in last. Uh, uh, 75 years which is great success for for europe of course ex except our uh, uh, civil wars uh, 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 specialists in, in in balkans but uh, i think this is a part of bigger process of creating uh, maybe some uh, much more deeper european identity uh, uh, we are trying to find that complicated balance between uh, some kind of unity and, and a lot of diversity European Union uh, have by default of uh, what Europe is. And I think sometimes uh, because of that really complicated way that European Union uh, make decisions, uh, we are losing sense in, in bureaucracy. And uh, but when we are create some uh, uh, more focused and more concentrated uh, idea about what's going on in European Union. I still think that uh, European Union is a really great part of the world. We are definitely not uh, competent in business as states or China or South Korea or uh, Japan is. I don't think that the European Union, maybe with the exception of, of Germany, uh, 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 will be as competitive as we uh, were sometimes, but I think European Union is a great place, place uh, for, for living. And I hope that culture will be uh, in next year's tool, which will improve uh, that complicated European way of life. Uh, uh, even we don't know what European way of life is. <laughs> 
Great, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Philip. Well, I'd certainly like to, to echo um, the very positive view of the European peace dividend that, that we've just heard. And I, I only wish uh, uh, enough of my fellow citizens had recognized that this was perhaps <laughs> the fundamental reason for belonging and not getting sidetracked by other things. Uh, I do think one of the things we haven't really talked about enough, um, perhaps this would be the project for a future conversation, is um, the way in which the digital single market is an absolutely crucial development for culture and for cultural exchange uh, and for cultural competitiveness on a global scale. And to that extent, the way in which the European Union is developing as a regulatory supranational entity, and you know, particularly the standoff with uh, global platform players, the, the FANGs is, 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 is a very, very important part of the wider stage. So I think we've talked about, if you like, the, um, the 1.85 billion euros that are spent <laughs> supporting culture in a very explicit kind of way, I think, there are much, much bigger games afoot when we get away from thinking about these programs to thinking about the kind of um, organizational, political, economic, regulatory reconfiguration that is the background to everything we've been talking about. Well, thank you for that, and I think you set the stage for another uh, another another conversation. Um, so we are out of time. I want to thank Klaska and Philip and Yvonne and Randall who left us earlier for all of your wonderful insights and for participating in today's conversation. Um, I know I learned quite quite a lot, and I'm sure our our our, our audience has as well. Uh, for those in the audience, um, we have a survey that we'd like you to fill out um, as as usual um, with with your uh, feedback. And um, the link is uh, is in the chat. Um, so thank you all again, and uh, we look forward to seeing you for future uh, roundtable discussions. Have a good afternoon or evening, depending where you are. Thank you. <laughs> Ciao.